Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am so excited about today's video. If you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen me post about it, but I recently purchased an authentic newspaper from 1817. Wow, so beautiful. I thought it would be really cool to make a video about it and talk about the interesting things that jumped out at me when I was reading it, and hopefully to hear from you guys. Um, at the end of the video, I'm going to post, I don't know how yet, but I'm going to post clear images of the whole thing. So please, if anything jumps out at you, anything I didn't mention, or if you know more about the things that I talked about, or if I got something wrong, please just tell me in the comments below, because I want this to be a discussion. I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say. Before we jump into this, I wanted to mention briefly that I have created something called The Curious shop. I wanted to make an online store that could sort of celebrate the unusual aspects of history and the world. Basically everything that I talk about on my channel. I know a lot of you out there, for example, are really interested in the revolution, just like I am, or John Andre, just like I am. One example of something that I offer is this phone case that has the sketch that John Andre made of himself the day before his execution. So it's a, one of those plastic phone cases. There's just something really interesting about sketches and doodles <laughs> that people in the past made. I've always loved the sketch and you can buy a phone case with it. I have it and also my mom wanted one as well. All the designs that you see on the site are either designed by me or curated by me. You'll see what I mean. I would really love it if you checked it out. The link again is in the description below. Also there's free shipping on orders of $50 or more. I think you have to place the order by December 8th if you're trying to get something in time for the holidays, but maybe you're just like me and love buying stuff for yourself all year round. <laughs> anyway, take a look below and let's get started on this. So this is the New York Spectator. My research tells me that this ran from 1804 to 1867 as a semi-weekly semi newspaper. This particular newspaper was published on Wednesday, February 26th, 1817. I'm going to read the bits that I found interesting out loud, and I'm also going to put them up on the screen so you can read along and see what it looks like. So first of all, I don't know how many of you watched my video where I bought a medieval antiphonal leaf and I started crying because it was incredible. Holding this in my hands. So the first thing that I thought was cool was here. A London paper of the 2nd of December mentions that Bonaparte is actually engaged in composing the annals of his life, and that he employs Count de las Casas as his amanuensis. Amanuensis is a new word for me, I googled it, and it means a literary or artistic assistant, in particular one who takes dictation or copies manuscripts. So that makes sense. The Count has informed a Mr. Warden that the campaigns of Egypt and Italy, and what Bonaparte calls my reign of a hundred days, were already completed, and that the intermediate periods were in a progressive state. So this is a time when Napoleon was still alive. To be honest, I have not spent much time learning about Napoleon beyond, you know, the standard things everyone knows. For a brief rundown, in 1814, Napoleon was exiled in Elba. In March of 1815, he escaped exile, got back into power for what is called the Hundred Days. And by July 1815, he was defeated again and then exiled again, this time to St. Helena, where he lived the rest of his days until 1821. So since this newspaper was published in 1817, he was well into his exile in St. Helena. And at this present time, he's off in St. Helena dictating his memoirs to the Count de las Casas. I looked this up and I found what I think is a copy on Amazon. I'll link to it below. And also what might be the full text of the memoirs. I will link to that as well. But I think it's really cool that presently, because, you know, reading this newspaper, you can really put yourself in that time. Like, what is happening at present? At present, Napoleon Bonaparte is writing his memoirs. Cool. The next thing that jumped out at me, this news comes from Paris. It says, two propositions have been submitted to the chamber, which has resolved to entertain them. The first is to decide that in the future, the chamber will not hear written speeches, except the reports of commissions and motions. This is a very proper measure. Nothing is so fatiguing as the manner adopted in the present chambers of reading speeches. No one replies on the instant. Three weeks have sometimes elapsed before a reply is given, and by that time, the original speech to which it purports to be an answer is forgotten. And besides, in three cases out of six, the speech is not written by the speaker. This was so notorious that a person in a French paper advertised to write speeches pro and con. 
He was employed by two members of different parties, one a citra and the other an ultra. By mistake, however, he delivered the wrong one to each, so that when the citra mounted the tribune, he began a speech against himself, and vice versa, the ultra did the same. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Just a little bit of humor injected into the tedium of politics. There's a lot of political stuff in here, and I don't know all of the context of everything, so please, if you know of anything that I do not talk about, or if you have any more information of the things that I do talk about, please put them in the comments below. Next, here we have Mrs. Clark, the wife of Mr. Clark, of the Sheffield Theatre, was unfortunately burnt to death on Friday last, from her clothes taking fire by the candle accidentally falling at the same time she was employed in ornamenting a muslin dress. She immediately rushed into the street, the flames gained new vigor from the air, and in a few moments the unhappy woman was one terrific blaze from the ground to a considerable height above her head. This poor Mrs. Clark. I tried looking her up to see if there was any more information about her and I could not find anything. So again, you see how long this front page is, and I only mentioned just a few things that jumped out at me, but I am sure when you guys look at it yourselves, you'll find more interesting things, especially if you have any knowledge of, you know, the government at that time. Next, here, Monday, February 24th. It's just one little sentence here. New Secretary of State. The Baltimore Patriot on Wednesday last announces on the authority of a letter from Georgetown that the Honorable John Q. Adams is to be the next Secretary of State, and the Honorable Henry Clay, the present Speaker of the House of Representatives, is to be appointed Minister to the Court of St. James. That's a pretty cool mention. <laughs> Throughout this entire newspaper, there are lots of shipwrecks happening. There's lots of mention of imports and exports, which is pretty cool. Um, which ship arrived where, after how much time at sea, etc. Latest from England, the British packet Queensbury is below in 66 days from Falmouth and 14 from Bermuda. She has the December mail and brings London dates probably to the 12th or 15th of that month. As her letter bags are not up and the severity of the northeast snowstorm has prevented our boat from going down, we are not yet put in possession of our regular files of papers and commercial lists. Here we have a bill granting certain privileges to disabled firemen in the city of New York, which passed the assembly some days since, has this morning passed the Senate. And here we have a wild cat has been lately killed, no more than 18 miles from this place in the town of Andover. It was shot while parrying the attacks of a large dog in its hind legs by a gentleman who was in search of rabbits and afterwards killed by the butt end of his following piece. It had been before frequently seen, and in one instance sprung at a woman who was riding alone, with such violence as to break the back of the chase. But the woman reached her own door in a state of insensibility, having received no injury but from her fright. We hope the gentleman who has the skin of this animal will present it to the Linian, Linian Society in this town. Somebody please tell me what that word is. I'm sure it's a very well-known word and I'm just not processing. Also, be aware. A bear has been seen in the wood where the wild cat was killed. Constant vigilance. Next up, we have some violence from London. On the evening of Monday the 14th of October, between the hours of 6 and 8 o'clock, the dwelling house of Lawrence O'Hara Sr., situate in Gowell, in the parish of Kilbeath, in the county of Mayo, farmer, and of his son, L. O'Hara Jr. of Colmeen, in the said parish, about a quarter of a mile distant from each other, were successively entered by three persons armed with pistols and swords, who, after murdering the said L. O'Hara Sr. by shooting him through the head, breaking his jawbone, and mangling his body in the most brutal manner, repaired instantly, as is supposed, to the house of his son, who had about an hour before returned, fatigued, from the fair of Laughlin, about twelve miles off, and had laid down upon the bed to rest himself. When the first of the three persons rushed into the cabin with the door being open, and presented a pistol to his breast, which, as he started up, he had the good luck to parry, and the ball missed him, and hit the wall at the back of the bed on which it was found the next morning. A second person, rushing at this instant, made a cut at him with a large sword, which he also warded off, and had actually released himself from both of them, and was making out of the door when he found there a third person. 
his own brother-in-law, whom his father and himself had been compelled to dispossess of his holding under them about six or eight months ago, and was supposed to be at that time in England. Oh, snap which third person charged at him with a pitchfork and small sword to prevent his escape, and made several lunges at him with the fork, wounding him in five or six different parts of the body. But having got hold of the prong or fork, he wrenched it from the pole to which it was attached, and was then dreadfully wounded by the small sword under the right arm. The three ruffians then attacked him all together and threw him on the ground at the door. But still struggling and crying out, he alarmed a neighboring house, and a woman happening to come out, the villains suddenly made off. And as they passed the woman, one of them gave her a cut over her forehead, which has disabled her ever since. Oh my god. How crazy was that story? That was almost a double murder. Next up we have the present king of Württemberg, on assuming the scepter of his deceased father, published a proclamation in which he assures his states that, quote, the welfare and happiness of the subjects confided to him will be the sole object of his efforts, and that it will be his first endeavor to ensure the attainment of these great objects by a constitution suited to the spirit of the times, and to the wants of the people, and enhancing their prosperity. The new queen of Württemberg was delivered of a princess on the 26th Ultimo, ULT is an abbreviation for ultimo, meaning the past month, the previous month. The king allotted to his brother, Prince Paul, at his residence, the Palace of Mergentheim. I'm not sure what Württemberg is. It sounds German. If I find out, I will put it here. Thank you, editing Bridget. And now I will read what I find to be the most <laughs> memorable thing that I read in this whole newspaper, and it's entitled Mammoth Girl. Mammoth Girl. Lydia Monroe, who is now living in the town of Wyndham, this county, weighs 232 pounds. She is very healthy and active, and possessed of uncommon strength for a female. And that's the whole thing. <laughs> poor Lydia Monroe. This poor Lydia, just living her life, is now labeled for eternity as Mammoth Girl. Now I'm going to share two different obituaries from 1817, and they are quite different. At Northampton, on the second instant, so I-N-S-T is instant, meaning the present or current month, Mrs. Sarah Strong, consort of the Honorable Caleb Strong, late chief magistrate of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In the death of this lovely woman, the tenderest domestic ties have been rent asunder, the children have lost an affectionate and tender parent. The husband has parted with a companion dear to him as his own soul. Extreme fondness of retirement prevented Mrs. Strong from visiting the metropolis, metropolis while her husband was in public life. Home was her delight, her family the beloved source of her enjoyment. There, as a wife, mother, daughter, and friend, she exhibited the virtues and graces of the religion of the divine savior. During a long illness, she was sustained by the Christian's hope, and when, at length, surrounded by her afflicted family, death triumphed over her tender and exhausted frame, she gave evidence of the peace and serenity in which a Christian can die. And then there's a little poem. So that's a really beautiful obituary. Clearly she was very loved, she had a very rich and full family life. And then we get to the next one. In Brattleboro, Virginia, on the 24th Ultimo, after a short and very distressing illness, Polly Robinson, daughter of Dr. Archibald Robinson, in the 16th year of age. Like many other young persons, she had spent her days in carelessness and sin without remembering her creator or regarding the concerns of her soul. Her attention was awakened to the guilt and danger of this state during her sickness, while she had but little else than the gloomy prospect of death before her. In this awful extremity, God, who is rich in mercy to all that cry unto him, appeared for her help, and revealed in her soul a precious hope through the atonement of Christ. Her fears immediately subsided, her mind became calm, joy beamed in her countenance. She welcomed the approach of death as a messenger of God, sent to demolish her tenement of clay, that her joyful soul might go and join the society of kindred spirits in regions of immortality. One anxiety, however, exercised her mind till her last moments. It was that her friends and neighbors might find the savior whom she had found 
feel the joys which she had felt, and prepare for that blessed immortality, to which she was persuaded she was hastening." So basically, this is a 16-year-old who was living in sin, but it seems that she found God in her last moments, on her deathbed, and she is hoping that everyone else, her friends, neighbors, family, would all find God as well. It reads more like a cautionary tale than an obituary. It wasn't really about the person. I do wish it would have said more about who she was. I tried looking her up and I could not find this Polly Robinson. But through some research, I was able to find the first person here, Mrs. Sarah Strong. And that was really cool, getting to see her headstone. I will put a link in the description if you would like to see as well. So I'll be linking to Sarah Strong and also Caleb Strong, her husband. This, I think, is one of the coolest things that has come out of reading this paper. You know, you hear someone died in 1817 is one thing, but reading about her personality, reading about her very rich life, and getting to see where she's buried makes it more real. It makes these people much more three-dimensional. And when you go to an old graveyard and you look around, every single person has a story. Like I said at the beginning, I am skipping over a lot. There is a lot here. Um, you know, we have stock prices, we have market prices for oats and corn and barley. There's stuff about navigation law, which goes right over my head, but if anybody makes sense of it and has some interesting distillation of the context of it all, you know what to do. Now we're on the back. Here we have a section called Extraordinary. Extract of a letter from a gentleman of great respectability in New Jersey, who had lately visited Cape May to his friend, a member of Congress, in Washington. We have had very cold weather. As far as the eye can reach at sea from Cape Island, no water can be seen. Immense quantities of codfish have been thrown upon the shore dead. Many thousand wagon loads may be got at the Seven Mile Beach, a few miles from the point of Cape May on the seashore side. And the ducks have suffered so much and have become so impotent that a dog will take three or four hundred a day, but they are not eatable. They are so very poor." So that's pretty weird. Next up, a Spaniard who calls himself Jose Davis was taken up on Wednesday for stealing watches, etc., and a commitment given by the magistrate. Messrs. Applegate and Morgan, two constables, had the care of him and were proceeding to the jail when he requested permission to get his watch. They went into a house for the purpose, where was a shoemaker's stall. The Spaniard stooped down with the apparent intention of adjusting his shoe, but seized a knife and stuck at and wounded Morgan dangerously in the temple. Applegate then seized him behind, and they fell together on poor Morgan, who however extricated himself and ran into the street crying, murder! In the meantime, the prisoner managed his knife so dexterously that he wounded Applegate in the side, back, and groin. Very faint hopes are entertained of his recovery. Davis has since been committed for trial. Damn, he tried. So, last but not least, I will read a for sale notice. And I am probably going to pronounce the last name incorrectly. Please forgive me. For sale, all the real estate of Jacob Cohenhoven, deceased, situate at Terrytown, Westchester County, consisting of a large two-story dwelling house, well-finished, a large barn and other outbuildings, with about 25 acres of land, well-proportioned for meadow, orchard, and plowland. The above situation is not excelled in value by any on the Albany Post Road for a public house or store. Also, a public landing with a storehouse, dwelling house, and lot of ground. The above property will be sold together or in parts to suit purchasers. For terms, apply to Edward Cohenhoven, executor, or to Martha Cohenhoven, executrix, on the premises. I thought it was interesting just to hear a real estate listing. I was able to find where Jacob Cohenhoven is buried, which is at the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. And I have been to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery numerous times. Jacob Cohenhoven also married Martha Cohenhoven at the Old Dutch Church, which is famous in its own right as a historical church, but many people know of it now because it is the church mentioned in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, written by Washington Irving. I'm going to put links to what I found on this person in the video description. Also, I wanted to try and find any information about this land that was put on sale. I wanted to find out how much it sold for, what part of Terrytown it is today, 
um, how much it's worth today, but I couldn't find that information. So there you have just one small fraction of what there is to find in this newspaper. Again, if you look at the images more up close and you find anything interesting, please bring it to my attention. In addition to this newspaper, I also bought one from, I think it's 1791 and one from 1685. I might be getting those years wrong, but if you like this video, the format of going through an old newspaper together, please let me know. Give this video a thumbs up. Tell me because I would love to make more if you guys find it interesting. Also, I want to mention that I am considering selling this because I plan to buy even more and I know I can't hold on to every single one of them. So if you are interested in an authentic, real, this is not a copy, real newspaper from February 26th, 1817, reach out to me with an offer, an offer I can't refuse. <laughs> and again, please don't forget to check out The Curious Shop. You can get a cool thing like this. I would really appreciate it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time.